Now, to start off the conversation, I am joined by Catherine Coley, the CEO of the US arm of Binance, the largest exchange in the world in terms of volume. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Glad to be here. Also joined by Max Boonen, the founder and CEO of B2C2, one of the largest OTC desks in the sector. Hi, Max. Hi, Noel. Very happy to be here. Glad you're here. And Miha Girchar, the head of business development at Bitstamp, one of the oldest exchanges in the world. Thanks so much for being here, Miha. Thank you. Now, it's been quite a day, hasn't it? It's been quite a month, let's face it. It's been quite a year. And before we go into more halving related questions, which I'm sure we all are very interested in, I'd like to ask you, Max, about the March the 12th, which we affectionately known as Black Thursday, and on which Bitcoin at one stage was down over 40%. Now, you move a lot of big volumes and a lot of, uh, you know, high, high volatility. So what was that day like for you? Well, interestingly, because of the coronavirus, um, a, a big chunk of our team was in our BCP location, the location that we go to when, you know, everything's going wrong and there might be, let's say, a, a, a nuclear war uh, coming out. And we were just testing that location actually on that day. So we happened to no, be wait, a bunch of a us. Is it, a is it a secret location? Um, it, it is secret, yes, um, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but everyone everyone was there and, and, and that was a good thing because... Other than that, would have been in all sorts of different locations, and and so that that allowed us to be all on top of the ball and and provide the best prices throughout the day to our clients. But it was a very uh, a very you know traumatic experience for a lot of firms in the in the market. So it was very important for us to be there, providing liquidity when our clients needed it the most. It must have felt really quite surreal, also I imagine being all together when you're not used to that, and at the same time having just this weird stuff go on in the market. Catherine, where were you on that day? What was it? What was going through your mind? Yeah, that day that day hit in San Francisco for us. Our team was uh, preparing to take on the volatility uh, by just making sure that we were being able to quickly respond to tickets. We saw. Uh, thinking from the lockdown initial, we've grown as a team by seventy percent. So the influx of demand for using our platform has risen so much that we have to expand our team, which is great. We're able to offer more jobs to Americans remotely, not just in San Francisco. So there have been some silver linings to this, but it will be a day that we remember. You know, talk about having to scale up fast. You know, Mikha, you've been doing this for probably longer than anyone else here. Was this just another day in the markets for you? Or what were you? was there anything you were concerned about? Well, by now it's pretty. It was pretty much another day at the markets. Um, truth be told, we've seen quite a few run-ups, uh, price, and also uh, violent, violent sell-offs over the, over the years. So that kind of uh, drove our heavy investment into infrastructure, business continuity over the years. So I'm actually happy to say that it was pretty much a non-event for us. That is interesting. Was there anything that surprised you about the market's reaction to this or about how the infrastructure held up more broadly? The infrastructure held up exactly as we hoped it would. Uh, in terms of the market, um, I wouldn't say that for anyone being in market as long as Max or Catherine, for example, uh, that would be too much of a surprise either. Whereas the rest of us were glued to our screens, our jaws on the floor practically, and even those of us who've been covering this for quite some time, it just sort of felt somehow significant. Catherine, do you think that what happened on March the 12th is going to change the infrastructure in any way going forward? No, I mean, I, I kind of agree with Miha there. The infrastructure that Binance US is built upon was able to handle multiples larger volume that day that then actually took place on Binance US. Um, so we're preparing for a, a lo much larger tidal wave than people are actually taking place. So I think that's really the importance of our infrastructure continuing to uh, build and challenge uh, the system to make sure that we can uh, stay held um, during these volatile times is really important. Indeed. Max, you've written and spoken often about market infrastructure, its robustness, its resilience. What surprised you about the reaction after that intense volatility? Well, I think the main surprise, in my opinion, was that one of the main exchanges that sort of led the, 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 on the way down and, and, and a lot of people started complaining about liquidation was, was BitMEX. And, and what really surprised me is that unlike other similar derivative platforms, their insurance fund 
was not affected in in any way. Um, and it's well known. It's known to be the the biggest uh, insurance funds in in the industry. In the industry, they started it a long, long time ago. And whereas the likes of Deribit and other platforms, you know, that too deep into their their insurance fund to 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 make some 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 traders whole. That wasn't the case on Bitmex. And I I think that comes down in part in a way to to policy as well. I think they could have decided to to do that as they wanted to. And I think that one of the consequences that, that you've seen thus far, um, a couple, you know, a couple of weeks after the fact, is that their open interest in terms of their, their derivatives has not come back uh, as much as the others have uh, on the likes of Deribit, Binance Futures, and similar platforms. So it seems to me that um, the, the the client base of, of BitMEX was either more affected or or felt like the, the, the response from the exchange was not appropriate and some people decided to take their, their business elsewhere. That was one of the main surprises after the fact. We have seen their open interest decline. We've seen open interest increase on other platforms. Do you think investors are staying away now or do you think they're just moving? I think that um, one of the risks that was not properly priced before and is starting to be priced better now is the risk that you have when you trade Bitcoin with collateral in Bitcoin uh, to support your positions. What you tend to have then is if you're long, and you're collateralizing your position with Bitcoin. As the market goes down, the value of your collateral also goes down. And so what we're, start, what we're starting to see now is a bigger discrepancy between the platforms that use Bitcoin as collateral and platforms that don't. And there's two main ones at the moment that are like that. There's Binance Futures and there's the CME. Those are the two major ones. And you're starting to see slightly different prices on those two platforms to account for that, that difference in how trades are collateralized. Miha, Bitstamp is a global exchange. Do you think different geographical areas reacted differently? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say so. There is probably movements that start in one part of the world and are then arbitraged across the globe. But I wouldn't necessarily say that a specific uh, region led Catherine, have you seen investors exit because of the heightened volatility? You have you announced earlier this morning that Binance is launching an OTC desk. Is this because you're seeing greater demand rather than less demand and greater sized orders rather than large investors staying away? Yes. In fact, since the lockdown, we've seen uh, the downloads for our app double as well as the assets under management uh, go up uh, closer to 60%. So we've been able to see just an influx of people adopting digital assets and wanting to be able to stay nimble between these markets and traditional markets. So that's really where why we're seeing that? The participation. Why is, the interest, why is the interest growing in your opinion? Part of it comes from the accessibility of digital assets. It's 24 seven. You can trade it from your phone uh, or home. Uh, it doesn't allow, you know, it doesn't have as many barriers to entry as other markets and people can engage in it more frequently, especially in these times where we're focused on staying healthy and at home. Uh, so I, th I think that's where we're seeing this pickup. Uh, in that essence, our OTC trading is really to be able to provide an easier way for folks to be able to buy larger than $10,000 um, amounts in, in lump sizes that don't go through our order books. So that anonymity is something that often market players are asking for. I mean, speak from personal experience, the lockdown certainly is a time to explore areas you haven't really had the time to get your head around at first. Mika, you deal with all types of clients, largely institutional, I imagine. Are you seeing a shift in interest recently? And do you think the halving might have something to do with it? Um, actually, the, whole, the space as a whole saw a gradual uh, introduction of a number of institutional players throughout the years. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily say that the halving itself is the catalyst, but it is a continuation of a trend that started quite some time ago. And I think it's going, going to continue. What triggered that trend? Um, for sure, it was uh, price appreciation, introduction of uh, CME futures. Uh, so it was 
In general, I would say the introduction of more maturity, more robustness, and also uh, more interest uh, from a wider trading population. Um, and this is both retail as well as institutional in general. Max, have you seen a shift in the types of clients that are coming in the door now and the types of new clients? For the most part, our, our client base is, is very mature. And, and they've been in the market for a long time. One of the main reasons for that is that we were the first desk to launch an electronic OTC platform in 2016. And in 2019, we were the first European company to get a market making license in Europe. And so what that means is that I, I think we've got the biggest institutional client base in the market. So those, those people have been there for a long time. Seeing new institutions coming for us is you know, just another week in crypto. So I don't think really that the, that for client base, the, you know, the, the mix has shifted. What we see is that um, you know, different segments in our client base are settling for some, you know, you're seeing typical strategies emerge. I, I'll give an example. In, in, in the Asian market, particularly in Japan, where we, were, uh, we have a particularly high market share, what you see is that the, the user base there transitioned away from foreign exchange trading where the volatility has been really low well in the past couple of years i guess it picked up a little bit with the virus but overall it's been it's been quite low so people have shifted from foreign exchange to trading crypto through the same broker that they were trading foreign exchange with and so you you see the characteristics of the of the market in japan when it comes to to FX apply to cryptocurrencies as well so one of the main characteristics uh, of the foreign exchange market in japan is that by and large, the populations tend to be contrarian. So that, that applies when they trade crypto as well. You're going to see that on the way up, they're going to be selling. On the dips, they're going to be buying. So you, we're seeing more and more people sort of silo themselves into trading styles that, that are more typical of, of, con, of what they do in conventional markets. So more currency play than an ideology play or even an investment value play. Is that right? Uh, I, I would say that when it comes to our client base specifically, there's a lot of more speculative activity. Um, and so, you know, it tends to it tends to be what drives a big volume. You know, you want people buying, you want people selling, not just asset managers that buy some Bitcoin and sit on them. That, that's not what drives the volumes uh, on our side. Catherine, you do quite a lot of crypto education. You talk about it a lot. You write about it a lot, too. And has the halving impacted the interest that you're seeing from the broader public, not necessarily by Binance US clients, but general interest? And I checked a second ago, there are now only four blocks to go. Do you think this is a factor in the broader interest and will it continue to be so? It's given us an example to point to and say, this is some of the genius that's behind Bitcoin's code. Look at it in real time. So being able to have a, an event where people can witness something take place really lets them learn more about it in real time, which is the important part for us to be able to advance education. So it's been an attractive event for certainly getting uh, people's attention to it, but you can learn about Bitcoin anytime, anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're starting now or if you started in 2011. Uh, or 2009, um, it, you know, I think that's one of the biggest hurdles is people think they're late to the game. But learning about this, you know, we're all so still early in this space. So uh, keep learning, keep asking questions, and, and we'll keep it advancing what we can be providing. That is a very good point. We are so early to the game. And you know, the why the halving is a fascinating facet of Bitcoin's technology, especially given what's going on out there with monetary easing. We have so much else going on. We have the Paul Tudor Jones acknowledging that he is long Bitcoin. We have we have volatility. We have new products coming into the market. We have a global a global macro system that are getting increasingly interesting. Miha, from where you are in Europe, how do you see the interest in Bitcoin evolving going forward, given all of these threads? Do you think that there will be a mainstream tipping point at some stage because of the narrative, or is that still years away? I think we're still a few years away. Um, although things are getting better and better and bigger and bigger throughout, you know, as the years pass. But still, if we really think about the institutional players, uh, like pension funds, I think we're still some time away. Uh, just by looking at volatility, uh, that would be enough to kind of scare some of these market participants away. 
Uh, indeed, as we have seen recently. Max, what would you like to see change in the infrastructure to give investors of all types more comfort in terms of its resilience and transparency? Well, um, I could talk for ages about what I would like to see change, but perhaps I want to talk about what I would like to see not change. And, and Catherine touched upon something that's important to me. She mentioned the accessibility of, of, of educational material. Uh, one of the things that's important in crypto is its transparency and the fact that it's a level playing field in a lot of ways and everyone can access the data. You know, you, you, you well know that in conventional markets, you have to pay tremendous sums of money to get access to financial data. That's not the case in, in crypto. Similarly with Bitstamp, Bitstamp has, is one of the longest running exchanges in the world. And since day one and without interruption, they've made their data available to anyone with an internet connection, be it through their website or through their, their API. I think that's something that's really important. We need to keep this uh, an, an, open, an open market, a level playing field, such that if someone thinks that that they've got a strategy that they want to be you know an investor and they want to to have access to the same you know the same data the same level of information as everyone else then they can what what would worry me is that the entry of Paul Tudor Jones who is a legend an absolute legend and and others is that the market starts coalescing a little bit too much around institutional interest when really what we're trying to do here we're trying to make things better for for the everyday man um, and so that's uh, that's something that's quite important to to me, and I think to uh, to to Catherine and and Miha as well. Miha, do you think there's a danger of centralization of data? We see this in traditional markets a lot, and Max is right that crypto data is transparent, is accessible to all if you if you know how to read it. But not everyone is providing it like you are. Do you see a risk of centralization there? Uh, not not just yet. Uh, like Max pointed out, uh, accessibility and level playing field is still very much the name of the game, even in the exchange space. And uh, the first exchanges that would start limiting that may even risk uh, a little bit more than just than just uh, you know uh, some extra dollars that they can make uh, on on the data. There is so much change going on in the market, as we have seen here today, and as anyone who's followed Coindesk ever since the beginning can certainly attest. The biggest change that the Bitcoin network will be seeing over the next, for the foreseeable, you know, for the past, for the past future, and for the foreseeable future, is. Coming up in a few minutes, we are now four blocks away from the Bitcoin halving. That doesn't mean it's going to happen right away. Blocks do happen at variable times, as you know. But it is very likely to happen while you are watching us here on Crypto Long and Short.